All right, welcome back to class today. Uh, Thursday, I think, yes, 9.30 a.m., New York City, live. Um, so before starting the lesson, still some shout outs for interesting things. Um, so, okay, as you can see from the terminal, this is a very interesting utility you can use for listening to music, perhaps. Uh, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so on Twitter, I found a, another person that is also following suit as Yobi Byte from last week, a uh, couple of weeks ago we saw. So also Andreas uh, is creating uh, read, like uh, summaries of papers uh, using uh, Notion, right? So you have like, if this thing loads up, maybe it doesn't load. There we go. <laughs> uh, the what, why, how, and then <clears throat> the end, right? So this is very uh, relevant and important, I think, in order to be able to uh, get, you know, some sort of sense out of these many papers. Um, what else? We saw something else, I think. Um, and also, yeah, Yobi Byte has kept going with these papers. So if we go on Yobi Byte profile, we see that he has this, I don't know, the latest one, which is the role of planning, right? Um, on the role of planning in model-based deep reinforcement learning. Cool. Still this kind of template, which is very convenient. Uh, I also found a website which is uh, helping you read uh, papers uh, collaboratively, right? I'm uh, not sure. Hold on. Uh, where is it? Oh, this one. So in this case, you can um, you can ask questions uh, maybe to the author or to other peers that are reading the same paper. Like, hey, does anyone know? what this mean and so on. So this is like, I think, uh, a very nice, convenient way of reading paper together. It's like reading groups. And if this thing actually is going to be used by many people, it actually is going to be helpful, right? So uh, you should check out this. I think share there's not enough likes right now. I think people should use this extensively in order to be able to digest more papers, right? Because otherwise, how do you learn new things? I cannot be always next to you by your side and try to explain things. We should be always uh, helping each other and provide our, you know, knowledge to others, right? Because we are kind people. All right, enough talking about uh, website and, and stuff. And so we can start the lesson. Um, from today. So what do we talk today about? Uh, and we go in full screen. All right. So foundations of deep learning. Me. <laughs> Alf, okay. Uh, so today lesson is going to be slightly more mathematical, perhaps, uh, as in there is quite a bit of notations and you should really try to uh, stay, uh, you know, up to not up to speed. How do you say? Stay with me, right? If something gets lost, then you might get lost and you can't recover. So try to pay attention carefully. And if you don't get something, ask me to repeat. I can repeat forever. I don't mind. Okay. All right. So today, today, finally, we talk about attention. Um, why do we talk about attention? Because have we seen like from the last two years in uh, uh, natural language processing, attention has had such a major uh, you know, effect, and we had so much, so many good results. Moreover, recently, uh, we also saw many results of applying attention and something that we're going to be learning about later, which is called the transformer to image data. Okay. Uh, but what are these models about, right? So what is the, um, thing that actually dif dif differentiates attention from other techniques we have so far, seen so far. Well, attention actually works on sets, works on sets of elements. Uh, whereas we have seen before that like both convolutional and recurrent network operate on uh, uh, lattices, right? So on some sort of grid in one dimension, uh, two dimensions or three and so on, right? Regular uh, grids. 
this actually uh, this architecture here operates just on a bunch of vectors um, which don't have necessarily to be in a grid okay so this is like a first relaxation we, we are going to be seeing today. Uh, next week, we're going to see how to learn uh, information and in, in, in data on uh, uh, graphs where a given structure is given to you, right? So these are becoming a little bit less, uh, I would say, common, perhaps common knowledge, like it's a little bit more niche. Uh, and it might take some effort to actually understand what's going on. Okay, so just Stay with me. I take you. I take you by hand from beginning to the end line. Okay. All right. So attention. Uh, there are two different types of attention. We have self or cross attention, and then we're going to be also seeing this distinction between hard and soft attention. Okay. Anyway, we are going to be dealing with sets. What are some examples, right? So we start from there. So these were the slide from the recurring neural net lecture where we have seen four different mappings, right? Sequence to vector, vector to sequence, sequence to vector to sequence, and then sequence to sequence. If you don't remember, watch the recording. So today we're gonna be introducing a additional term, right? It's gonna be set. So we have all possible combinations, right? And I, I just wrote a few of them, the one that are actually, you know, I, I could actually think about. There are more, and maybe I'm not, you know, uh, capable of finding the specific example, right? Anyway, use cases. Uh, first one is going to be image to set. Uh, for example, we're going to be mapping an image to bounding boxes, right? Uh, and an example of this is going to be the Dieter paper we uh, talk about during class, right? So um, the image basically uh, it's going to be the input and then the output is going to be this set of bounding boxes. You don't necessarily know which output corresponds to which bounding box. You can permute the output, still going to be the same set of bounding boxes, right? Uh, I don't believe there is a necessarily a order in bounding boxes, right? So that's why it's image, the input through, you know, possible sets, a uh, set of possible bounding boxes, right? Um, so this is the first case, right? Second one is going to be set to set. For example, the input is going to be point clouds uh, to bounding boxes, right? So point clouds are going to be the X, Y, and Z coordinate of perhaps like a LiDAR image. And then you want to group uh, different points that are belonging to this, you know, set of points in the input to these specific uh, regions in the output. Again, which are not ordered, right? So again, set. So the sets are dealing with the fact that there is no order, right? Or we can have a sequence to sequence. So why am I talking about a sequence if we are talking about sets? Well, if you have a set and you add a counter, which is telling you which item comes before the other, well, the set becomes a sequence, right? So if you have a set of five elements, like, like you have the set of like natural numbers, right? Uh, from one to five, one, one, two, three, four, five, right? A set means you can swap the order, it's going to be still the same uh, five elements. But given that those items are sortable, right? A set can also be uh, considered a sequence, right? If things are sortable. And so these networks that operate on sets can also operate on sequences if you provide a sorting mechanism, right? And these are called positional embeddings. Like you can add some knowledge about the location of where these items are supposed to be uh, appearing, right? In order to be able to sort them. So an example would be translation, right? Uh, you have a, a sequence, which is going to be, you know, a sequence of symbols, which we're going to be representing a set is a set of symbols, but each symbol will also have information regarding its own position, right? And so one set is going to be uh, an order, uh, you know, sequence of items, and then for the input language, and then the other one is going to be the target language, right? Or the other one, which is going to be I already talked to you a couple of lessons ago, uh, three lessons ago, right? Which was the DALI uh, architecture. Um, DALI was that network that was generating those very uh, pretty pictures 
given a textual description, right? That, that's crazy. So the input is going to be, again, this order set, which is, again, a sequence. And then the output is going to be somehow this image, right? Uh, an image has order, right? So you need to actually uh, provide the order on, with which these items are uh, generated. Um, perhaps I'm going to make a lesson on this Lali uh, as well. Architecture is interesting, I think. Uh, which is using uh, the, um, a discrete variational autoencoder is an image feature compressor, image like image uh, encoder, like image compressor, I guess. Yes, and then it's using this transformer we're going to be learning uh, today to generate these images. Uh, sorry, to generate. Um, yeah, to generate the images, we are using the transformer and the input is going to be uh, the text, right? So the input is the text. And then we try to generate some sort of comp compact representation of the image. There you go. Which is given to you by a uh, code of a variation, variation autoencoder. Uh, then we have, for example, set uh, sequence to set. For example, if you have a um, sequence of uh, like a signal, a one dimensional um, electrocardiogram, and then you want to find the location of some, uh, let's say, uh, dangerous or whatever an anomalous sequ uh, sequence, right? Part, right? So you're going to find the extent and the location of these regions, right? So it's like bounding boxes in 1D, more or less. You can have image to vector, for example, the image uh, visual image transformer. Uh, you can have sequence to vector, uh, which is going to be this order set to a mov movie review, for example, right? Uh, to a vector. Anyway, enough uh, motivation. I think uh, we can start with the actual lesson. Okay. Cool. So self attention. We're going to be talking now again about sets, right? And this is going to be the notation I use for sets. You have the vector, like in this case, a ball X index I, and then you have curly bra uh, brackets, right? And then you have the I equal one to T. So in this case, I'm going to have these vectors X one, X two, so on until X T in a curly bracket, right? So again, you can swap them. Nothing changes. It's still the same set. Okay. So the set is going to be the same set given you permute the items within it. Cool. So each item here, my X I is going to be my vector, uh, my input vector in, a, in an N dimensions. Okay. So the I represents the ith vector, not the ith element, right? The I is actually white. So it's just, a. uh, um, I abuse a little bit the notation in order to identify the ith vector in the set. Okay. So the only equation we have in attention is the following, right? So that's quite easy, I think. So H is going to be my linear combination of my vectors in my set by using these coefficients alpha. Okay. So each vector in the set will have a mixing coefficient, alpha one, alpha two, alpha whatever t, right? Which are used to scale the amplitude now of these vectors, and then you sum them all up, all of them, right? So as you uh, one one restriction here, we actually have that these alphas are positive, so we actually just sum, you know, from zero like a scaling factor going from zero to the maximum to whatever value you want. We don't flip them, right? There is no negative alpha. And we can also use uh, some notation here and we convert this set which with arbitrary order of these vectors in this matrix. Okay. And so those axes are columns, right? You had several axes, uh, bold vector, uh, bold lowercase axes. I just put them together into a box, right? And so I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get the capital X. So pay attention here. The capital X height is N. Okay. So if you have many columns, right? I just put them together in a box. The height is going to be N, right? How many vectors I have? Lowercase t. And so the width 
of this big box is going to be lowercase t, whereas the height is going to be n. Okay, so keep in mind. So you have to actually keep in, in, in you know keep in mind these numbers, these letters. We have to figure out now. Uh, so actually, I'm going to draw. Uh, yeah, I answered the question a sec. I'm going to be drawing this box over here. Okay. So this big box, repeating once again, is the collection of all these vectors, vertical vectors. Each vector, x1, x2, x blah, xt, has height n. Okay. Are we? Are you with me? Yes. Put thumb up. Right. So the height of the vector is n. So the height of the box is going to be n because those things are of height n. n. And then how many of them you have? One, two, blah, 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 t, right? So the width of this big box has to be t. Cool. So here you have that this linear combination of vectors, it's simply the matrix capital X times A, OK? Because we know, uh, even though this semester I didn't go through uh, with you by, you know, by hand, that the a matrix vector multiplication, it can be thought as well as the linear combination of the columns of the matrix X. OK. So we already seen matrix vector multiplication. Where have we seen matrix vector multiplication? Remind me, type in the chat. Where have we seen mat matrix vector multiplication so far? Yeah, dense layer. OK, and so how do we think about dense layers? How did we say how did we say we think about dense layers? How do you call how do I call them? Yeah, linear transformation. Sure. No, how do I call them? Right. We, we I just keep repeating these two words all over the, that lesson, the second lesson, right? Yeah. Now, squashing is the nonlinear function, right? And rotation is the other one. OK, thank you. So I usually been, I've been telling you all the time, right? Uh, neural net is simply rotation, squashing, rotation, squashing, right? Here again, we have a matrix vector multiplication. In this case, I won't call this rotation because what would be rotating? What would be what would we be rotating in this case? The vector A doesn't make sense. Also, in the rotation part, the rotating part was which matrix? Who was doing the rotation? In the rotation squashing, rotation squashing, what was doing the rotation? The weights, right? The matrix, the, the, the rotation matrix was the weights matrix. OK, and so the network weights, which we are learning, are doing the rotation of my input vector that comes inside the network. Right. In this case, it looks very odd. We have this X, which is the combination of all these input, like this stack of all the inputs. It's rotating this A vector, which we don't even know what it is, right? So we don't think about that. Uh, we don't think about this uh, matrix vector multiplication in terms of rotation because it doesn't make any sense in this case. Instead, uh, we're going to be thinking uh, about it in this way, right? So whenever you have a, a matrix vector, you have the, the vector you know, has as many components as the column of this matrix, right? Because you're going to have that whenever you do matrix vector, it's going to be the first column times the first item, right? Plus second column times second item, plus third column times third item, time plus the last column times the last item, right? So this is vector matrix multiplication. If it's not familiar, you know, just review some uh, Gilbert Strang uh, first chapter of linear algebra, introduction to linear algebra. I hope it's fine. All right. So I'm going to be just writing here on top right the compact version, right? So my hidden layer is going to be the linear combination of the columns of X, which are the items in the set, right? So H, the hidden layer, is going to be the linear combination of the items in the set 
weighted by the coefficient in this a vector, which I call them alpha. Okay. Once again, my hidden representation is going to be the linear combination of the vectors in my set, right? I have my set, I have vector one, two, so on. I just do this, the linear combination of these vectors scaled by the coefficient, right? That are in this a, a, a. So regardless of the number of the vectors, H is going to be what size? What is the size of H? If H is the linear combination of vectors of size N, H is going to be size N. Okay, very good. All right, cool. Okay, I hope it's clear. So in the soft attention, we simply enforce that the sum of these uh, items in uh, A are equal one, right? And so basically it's like a probability, right? So if all items are greater than zero and the sum has to be uh, one, then they are basically, you know, basically a probability, right? Pseudo probability, whatever. In the hard attention instead, you just have that one item is equal one. So it's like a one hot encoding, right? So the hard attention, the A is like a one hot, uh, like a deterministic probability, like a deterministic mass density, right? And instead, the soft attention is going to be like a mass density across, you know, whatever uh, T elements, right? So the size of A is T because there are T vectors you need to scale, right? I hope it's fine. Moving forward, otherwise we don't even finish this lesson. Okay, this was first slide. We have two more slides, that's it. But you have to be very confident about this N, the size of N, and T, the items in the set, such that the size of A has to be also T because you have one coefficient per every vector. Mm. I hope it's fine. Self-attention, slide number two. What is this A? Ta -da! A is going to be the soft or just the argmax, right? Soft argmax or just the argmax of this thing here. What is this thing here? So we have capital X, which was this box of vertical, uh, of vertical vectors transpose, right? So now capital X transpose is going to be these horizontal vectors, right? Multiplied by my X. What is X, right? So capital X, lowercase x, right? So capital X is going to be this combination of columns, right? So you flip it, it's going to be combination of rows. Lowercase bold X is going to be a given item in the set, okay? The same as before, I was calling this H just this capital X A, a given A. So this is going to be like the generic X, okay? One of the items in the set i call it x i don't put i don't put the index i because i don't want to specify which one it's just one i don't care which one okay so what is the dimension of this a so if you have how many rows does capital x transpose have capital x had t columns right if i flip it you're gonna have t rows right then I multiply the first row times this one, like you have, you know, T times column, whatever is going to be T eventually, right? What are each multiplication telling you, right? What is the first row times the first, I, first column, right? And so what is the first row times the column? It's going to be the projection, right? Of the first item towards the, the given X, right? There's the projection of the second item towards the given X, projection of the third item towards the given X and so on, right? So we compute basically a vector which is containing all these projections. What are the projections? Projections are telling you how much aligned two vectors are, right? Basically. Cool. And then we send this through a argmax, which is going to tell you, oh, which is the highest match, basically, or a soft argmax, right? Which is going to tell you this probability distribution across this uh, across these scores, right? Done, finish, right? That, that's it. There is no much more. So what are the square, square brackets? That means it's optional, right? Uh, means you can choose to do soft argmax to have the probability or the argmax to have the one hot, right? And so 
let me recap the things, right? I had t's, t vectors, x, i, right? Dun, 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 dun. This implies that I will have a, a t, a mixing coefficient, right? If I have t items in my set, I eventually will end up having t attention vectors, right? Right? You're following, yes? And so we can put together this set of attention vectors into a box, right? Each attention vector has T elements, right? Because each atten attention vector, it's scaling those T columns, right? And then how many of them I have? Well, I have T, right? Because I have T axis, right? Cool. So given that I have a set of attention vectors, I will have T hidden representations, right? Which I can also combine into this big block, capital H, right? Cool. So finally, I can simply write that capital H, which is this big matrix of uh, hidden representation, is going to be this capital A, capital X, capital A, right? What does capital X, capital A means, right? So capital X, capital A means you have X times first vector, A is gonna be the first H. Then you have the matrix A times the second vector in the A matrix, you're gonna have the second items in the H and so on, right? So if you stack multiple vectors uh, after A, right? So you have the first vector of A, second, third, you're gonna have several outputs uh, in the, several outputs, right? After you complete the matrix multiplication. What is the size of H? Well, each item in H was the linear combination right, of these uh, items in my input set, which were of size N. So the height of H must be N, right? And then what is the, the, the width? Well, we had T items in the set. It's gonna have T hidden representation, right? One hidden representation per input vector. If you swap the axis, you can just swap the H's, right? There is no connection, uh, depend, like there is no information in the order, okay? Cool, so far, everyone's following. Are there questions? Can we say A is like a self-correlation matrix? Yeah, in this case, yes, of course it is. We are going to be learning now how to make things a little bit more interesting now. And this is like the foundational, like you had to, these, these first two slides are here in order to make you understand what's the difference between N, which is the size of the input or the size of the combination of the inputs. Because again, if you do linear combination of whatever vectors, you're going to get the same size. And T is the number of vectors you have. Okay. So these are the two main things we have here, N, T, right? And then how is H computed, which is the linear combination uh, of the columns, right? Of, of these items in the set. And A is gonna be given to you by these argmax or soft argmax, right? The, or the one hot or this probability. Cool, and there's the major uh, thing, which is called a key value store. What, what, what is this stuff, right? So it's a paradigm for storing or saving uh, retrieving or curing, querying, I don't know how to pronounce query, I think querying and managing an associative array, dictionary or hash table. What does this mean? So this means that we're going to be using these concepts here and convert them in terms of neural nets in order to store, save, no, retrieve, take out, query or managing our uh, information within a neural net, right? So we're going to be basically creating this associative array uh, in hash table where we put information and we can take out information when we want. So we start with these queries, keys and values. So back to this matrix multiplication where finally the matrix is the weight matrix, right? So what is Q? Question to people at home. How am I going to be describing Q using my jargon? Q is, finish my sentence, 
the rotation of X, then thank you. Very good. K, so Q stays for query. K is going to be, again, a rotation of my input X. V, which is a value, is going to be, again, my rotation of the uh, input X. What is X? Do we remember? X is the generic item in the set, right? You pick one, that's your X. Lowercase uh, pink bold X. Cool. So since the query, the key, and the values come all from the same X, this is going to be called a self-attention, OK? Next slide, we're going to see that what's going to be a non-self, right? What is the cross-attention? So far, let's just focus on this self-attention. So everything uh, we're going to be seeing in this slide is going to be exactly what we saw before, but we're going to be changing slightly uh, the content of that uh, soft argmax we saw before. So we can assume that query and we have to assume that query and key have the same dimension. We call it D prime. Why is that? Because we're going to be checking one query, which is my question, against all possible keys, okay, which are the things I can look up in my dictionary, for example, or in my uh, recipe book, okay? The, the titles, for example. So the query, my question, has to be matching the size of my keys, because otherwise I cannot compare them, okay? Let's call, let's say this way. On the other side, my V, which is the value, has a totally arbitrary dimension, okay? So V is gonna be the content. Let's say the content of a recipe, how to make um, pizza, okay? So the name of the pizza I want to make, like Margherita, uh, you know, a Diavola, or you want to make Calzone, or something like those, those are, the, those are the title of the recipes and those are in the key, okay? In the, uh, those are the some size key, the, 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 the title of my, uh, my recipe. V instead is gonna be the content of the recipe. It's gonna be very long with images and, uh, and, and explanation and whatever. The query is going to be uh, how to make pizza margarita, no? or how to make pizza Quattro stagioni, something like that, okay? So whenever I have a question, how to make something, I'm gonna check all the titles in my recipe book. Those are the keys, right? I check the, uh, which one is gonna be matching. And then I want to be retrieving the value, which is going to be the content of the recipe, okay? How do we do that? Well, uh, we we'll see that in a second. To simplify just notation, so I can remove all this D prime, this second, I just say that Q, uh, queries, keys, and values all have the same dimensions. But it's not true, right? The value, we, we just figure that is a very large, possibly, uh, recipe, right? Whereas the Q and the query and the key are simply the question and my, my, my title, right? So this is just an assumption to make notation simpler here. So how many items we had? We have T items in my set, right? X1, X2, X3, blah, blah, blah. T items in the set. This implies that we will have T queries, T keys, and T values, right? Because each query comes from the rotation of each item in the input set. Each key comes out from the rotation of each item in the input set. Each V comes out from the rotation of each item in the input set, right? So if we have a set of input, we're going to have a set of queries, a set of keys, a set of values, which I can also draw as boxes, right? I have a big box for Q, I have a big box for K, and I have a big box for V, right? Cool. So finally, last question of the day is going to be, what is my attention vector? My attention vector is going to be this soft argmax or argmax of this capital K transpose times Q. What does it mean? Given a query, Q, how to make pizza boscaiola, I have to check all the keys, right? So I have my, my vector here, my, my query, how to make pizza margarita, whatever. And then I have to check this with the uh, pizza margarita, pizza boscaiola, pizza quattro stagioni, pizza quattro formaggi, all different types of pizza, okay? 
one query, okay, again, all possible titles, right? So you're going to be checking one question, again, all your possibilities. How many possibilities you have? Remind, remind me. How many possibilities I have in a K, K transpose? T, right? Very good. Because we had T uh, columns, so we flip it, we're going to have T rows. I multiply T rows times one vector, and that's why they have to be the same dimension, right? So if my K is going to be D prime, also my Q has to be D prime. Otherwise, I cannot multiply this stuff, right? So I have T of this multiplied by one vector. What is the final size of my attention? T, because it's written also on the screen, right? Of course, we're going to have one score per each uh, key given a specific query, OK? I repeat, the uh, A, the attention vector, is going to have T items, one, two, three, until T. Each item will have basically a score corresponding uh, to a given Given a, uh, given a query, a score per each key in my recipe book. OK. So my hidden, my hidden representation H is going to be this weighted sum of the values of the, these items in the, in the V set, weighted by the coefficient in the A. Doesn't matter how many items you have in V, right? You can have the same items in V that are the uh, elements in A, right? Cool. Uh, we remember we have a beta, no, inverse temperature. We're gonna be setting that to one over square root of the dimension D. Why is that? Such that the temperature doesn't change as you change the, the dimension. Okay. Um, this is because. If you think about what is the uh, length of a vector in two dimension with both of them equal one, it's going to be square root of D. If you have what is the length of a vector in a three dimension with all set to one, it's going to be square root of three, right? And so the more, the longer the vector and the longer becomes the, you know, whatever expected uh, length. So we divide by the square root of D such that things are st still within uh, the same dimension, regard, like the same length, with, regardless of the uh, dimension. Okay, the technicality. We don't care. Now, how many queries? How many questions I have? Well, we had t items in my set. You're gonna have t questions, right? Therefore, this implies I will have t uh, answers, no t a t attentions vectors which implies I'm going to have a, a matrix, capital A, which is the combination of these columns, right? In the box, which is T by T. Why is T by T? Well, we said that each vector has T components, right? Because you're going to be using each component to weigh each item in my, in my value set, right? But then how many of these vectors I have? Well, I have one vector of T components per each item in my set, right? So you have T components and T items, right? So it's going to be a square matrix T by T. Cool. So final question, we just use all capital letters. Capital H is going to be capital V times capital A, which means the columns of this hidden matrix is going to be the linear combination of the column of the V matrix. And the linear combination coefficients are stored in this A matrix, which comes out from this scoring or this, you know, whatever you want to call it, between one query and each uh, key. Okay. I hope it's clear. If it's clear, we move on to the uh, one last tweak to this. Uh, to this presentation, which is going to be the, uh, let me clear up first, like actually, let me write that uh, on the top right, this um, just for a reminder, right? So we had the queries, which was a set of cues, no? A set of questions. And again, the height, each of them are D and you have T of them, right? So let me clear up the screen and we're gonna be talking now about replacing the 
input or whatever, replacing the X for keys and replacing the X for the values. What is this? So this is called cross attention. If before I was just thinking about how to make different pizza type, pizza, right? Plural of pizza is pizza, no pizzas, but anyway. So if before I was thinking how to make different pizza in my mind, so all information was coming from X, which is, you know, my own brain. Now actually I'm calling mom, mom, Xi, right? The, the other Greek letter. Mom, how to make blah pizza, no? And she tells me, right? So I have, my question comes from me, from lowercase x, but I call mom, which is going to be Xi. Mom has all the, the keys, no? Of course, mom always has all the keys uh, and all the recipes. And that's the only difference, right? How many questions do I have? Still T. But how many answers my mom has? You know, how many, what is the knowledge of a mom? Much larger than mine, right? And so Xi goes from J equal one to Tau, right? And Tau in this case, in this example is much larger than my T, right? For cooking, for sure. Anyway, so given that mom has a set of uh, Tau Xi, it will turn out that mom will have tau keys and tau values, Vs, right? And so these matrices, K and V, the height is gonna be still D, right? And the key, the K has to match, no? The, the key has to match my question, right? So still have to be D here, but then the width is gonna be much, much, you know, larger, right? Because mom is very knowledgeable. Hmm? You follow me, right? All right, so uh, let's watch, let's look at the equations, which are just slightly different, right? So we have that the attention vector now has tau components. Why does it have tau components? Well, simply because the capital K now has many, many more rows, right? It has tau, tau rows, right? And so you end up with tau mixing coefficients for the values that mom has, no? For the recipes that mom has. So mom has this huge repository of recipes. Each recipe is going to be weighted, weighted by a coefficient in this A vector. How many coefficients do you have? One per every recipe. How many recipes are there? Tau. Okay. What is the final size of H? D uh, second, which again, here I, so for simplification, I just put D. How many questions do I have? Oh, well, those are from me. I have little questions, you know? So I have T questions. And so eventually my final A matrix, we have T questions, right? T columns, but each mixing, um, each, each column will need to have tau elements, right? Because each of these coefficient will be used to mix those tau uh, recipes my mom has. So final equation, no big difference. You still have this H, which is the outcome of asking T questions by mixing these D dimensional values in my mom's recipe book or whatever. And so eventually you still get D times T, right? T columns of D size. Cool. Any question about how to make pizza? Is it clear so far? I hope so. I mean, I really try my best to, to explain things in a palatable way. Okay. You appreciate very much the pizza example. I'm glad. Uh, questions so far before I move on to the, uh, some more details. Where do you get Xi? Uh, I call my mom at the phone. in the analogy or in practice, you have two sets of inputs. Okay. So X was one set of inputs. Xi is another set of inputs, different number of items, right? I have T X's in my set here, my, 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 that are generating the question later on. And then here I have tau 
XIs, which are the XIs that are used for generating the keys and the values. If I do attention within myself, it's called self-attention. I just, you know, think in my own brain what I can do. If I want help and I call it, I call home, I just do cross attention because I've been asking questions to my mom, to a different set. Okay. I hope it's clear. So you have two different sets of inputs. Okay. Very good. All right. Moving on. Can I ask more questions? Yes. Um, so implementation. In this case, I'm talking about self-attention. So I just use one, one variable for easy of ease of notation. So here I can think about stacking all my uh, queries, keys, and values in one big vector such that I can compute this big vector by having this big matrix here, which is going to be the stack of the, 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 the WQ, WK, WV times my, uh, my X, right? So you have a stack of three matrices here, my X, you're going to have the stack of the three outputs, right? You can stack things both direction, right? You can stack multiple X's this way. You can stack multiple uh, matrices this way, right? All right, we see this, we've seen this already before, right? So we saw this uh, whenever we were talking about the recurrent neural net, we were having that uh, I was stacking multiple axes, uh, multiple axes in this case, right? Tac, tac. Uh, and there we actually were stacking this on horizontally. So you, we already seen this kind of stacking operation, right? So we are, we are going to be considering now H heads. So we can get like three heads for of dimension D, right? What, what is this? So in this case, I can stack multiple matrices, right? Even more. And in this case, basically, I'm going to be generating multiple questions given the same item in the set. So far, we have seen that there was one question per item in the set. In this case, if I have multiple question uh, query matrices, I'm going to generate multiple questions, multiple queries per given set uh, item in the set, right? No big deal. So I have multiple questions given the item in the set. I'm going to have multiple keys per item in the set, of course, because I'm going to check all those keys anyway for given a given question. And then I have multiple values possibly for a given X, right? So to, that's it. No, no, no big deal, right? So you can have multiple questions, keys, and values per given item, right? Uh, and then we finally use like a final rotation matrix. We dump down, like we, 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 we compress down this HD back to D dimensions, right? To go back to the whatever dimension we wanted. All right. So in the last uh, 10 minutes, we're going to be looking now at how this is actually used to do something uh, useful. Okay. So we're going to be talking about the transformer architecture. So transformer architecture. Last time I mentioned it was a encoder decoder architecture. It's not. It's an encoder predictor decoder architecture uh, used for natural machine translation. So let, let's figure out what is this stuff, right? So we saw already in a previous lab uh, how this network, the, the model, the architecture, the combination of this module for the uh, latent variable energy based model are uh, combined, right? So we have an X, which is our conditional variable, which goes inside a predictor. Uh, we have a, so those are shaded X, pink. We have a shaded blue Y, which is my target that goes inside the energy box. And then on top, I have a decoder, which is fed with the latent and the output of the predictor, right? Which produces this Y tilde, which I try to get close to the Y, right? So the E in the box is a spring, right? And so it's a spring that is like chum, chum, trying to get the Y tilde close to Y. Cool. So predictor, decoder. Predictor is fed with an X, right? To come in Y space, right? So predictor is necessary to move from one space to the other. All right. Then we also saw, uh, saw in a few lectures ago, uh, the autoencoder, right? The autoencoder doesn't have any more the conditional variable. It only has the target variable, right? We are going to just learn the uh, structure in these targets. 
And so the Ys goes inside an encoder, which gives me a hidden representation, why it's hidden because it's inside a model. Then I have a decoder, which is coming back to the original Y space. It's a Y tilde, tilde means more or less, circa, circa. And then there's a spring between the Y on the bottom and the Y tilde on top, such that those are close together. Finally, we introduce the transformer. So let me clear up the screen. And we have basically the same uh, item so far. So first difference, okay? So, so far, everything is the same, no big deal. <clears throat> First difference, we have this module over here. What is this module over here? So this is something that comes from digital signal processing. This is a Z minus one. Since Z, we use it for latent variable. Uh, I use a zeta in a Greek, same stuff, right? Doesn't matter. So what does, this, what does it do? This module uses a unit delay. So why it's a signal uh, a discrete time signal, like Y has, you know, representation at discrete in, uh, point in a time index. So There's no time in seconds, it's time index, right? One, two, three, four, and so on. So what does the data minus one do? What is this unit delay? Okay, no big deal. You have a sequence Y uh, at the index J, no? And after the module, you're gonna have J minus one. So you delayed one step, the sequence. So it's just a delay, one, one unit delay. Uh, you can call it delta t, but there is no t, there is no time, there is units, there are uh, indexes, okay? So there is a difference in um, discrete time signals and continuous time signals. Anyway, unit delay. Afterwards, what do we have? Well, we have an encoder, right? So similarly to the autoencoder, it's very similar to the autoencoder, but in this case, we have this delay item preceding the encoder. Okay, that's the only difference. And this is default to uh, when you perform language modeling, right? You want to be able to produce the future given the past. So you want to delay the input by, for example, here, one unit. Then on the other side, we have our observation. What is our observation? It's, you know, whatever we provide the system uh, during time training and evaluation. Y is going to be only provided to you during training. This X, pink, shaded, observed, goes inside an encoder. And so what do we do with this, with this encoded X and encoded delay Y? We feed them both through a predictor, which is going to give me the hidden representation H used to generate the Circa, circa Y, no, the Y tilde, which is the no longer delayed version, right? Because there is a spring between the Y tilde and the Y, right? So there is a spring between those two and the input to the encoder on the bottom right hand side here is the delayed version of my input, right? So I provide my predictor a delay version of the input. So this looks like exactly like a denoising autoencoder where the noise is a delay, unit delay module, okay? But otherwise it's the same as a denoising autoencoder. And it's not only a denoising autoencoder, encoder, but it has also an additional input, right? Uh, so it's a conditional, delayed, no, uh, very, um, denoising autoencoder. So a delay, <clears throat> a delay, denoising autoencoder is also called language model, right? So this is a conditional because I have another input X, conditional language model or conditional delayed denoising autoencoder, right? Cool, oh, not denoising, de-delaying, okay, whatever you want to call it, right? Anyway, so let, let me finish this. Uh, this is the transformer architecture. And in the paper, unfortunately, they call the encoder, they call it encoder, but the, the overall block here, decoder, predictor, encoder, delay, they call it decoder. And I'm like, no, it's wrong, okay? So this is wrong decoder. If you read the paper, you're going to see that the wrong decoder will have the collection of the encoder predictor decoder. <clears throat> it does not make sense. That's why I wanted to clarify today because I otherwise get upset that I cannot understand what's going on. I hope it's clear. What are X, Y, and Z? Oh, no, there is no Z here. X is the source sentence. Y is the target sentence. 
And Y tilde is the predicted sentence. Okay, cool. So in this case, the transformer encoder is made of several items. The first one is going to be the self-attention. And then we're going to have a convolution with a certain kernel size of one, okay? Which means it doesn't look at items that are nearby. It just look at this given item, right? And then you have this kind of, you know, thing moving around across the signal. Anyway, after the self-attention, we're going to have a residual block and a normalization. So, and also add, uh, after this convolutional uh, layer. So look, let's look inside this block, right? Here we have this add norm. So we have this residual item addition, and then we have this layer normalization. So the input is provided to the self-attention and then it's summed back to the output of its own self-attention. And similarly, in the hidden representation of this that comes out from this uh, self-attention module gets a, you know, one-dimensional convolution, and then we have also this uh, residual block and normalization. In this case, I'm going to be providing my X, right? So as you can tell, if it's an X, then this stuff cannot be called an encoder. It's going to be our predictor, right? And on the other side, we're going to get a set of hidden representation, right? So how many items we have the input? T items, right? One, two, three, four, until T. Similarly, we're going to have T hidden representations. One, two, three, until T. Uh, going from I equal one to T, right? These are the source, source input, so source sentence, source hidden representation. Then when I introduce the wrong decoder, we're going to have the following. So here we're going to be adding yeah, the decoder and right? quotations. Here we're going to have a cross attention, which is connected after the self attention, which is getting the hidden representation of the uh, source sentence, right? Then still normalization and residual connections. So as you can tell now, yeah, this is the wrong decoder, right? We can train this by providing the delayed uh, target sequence, you can see J goes from zero to tau minus one, whereas the output is going to be the hidden representation going from J equal one to tau, right? So it is a one shift and which is used later to produce those Y tildes J equal one to tau, right? So source I one to T target J one to tau, right? Different I J T tau, right? Different lengths doesn't have to be same length. How do we generate outputs during inference? Well, during inference, I just produce the first output here and then I put it back here, right? I generate a second output and I, I produce a second one. So during inference, I'm going to be using a auto regressive manner, right? Technique to generate one item at a time. But the cool part that is during training, I can combine all the outputs at the same time, right? Before with recurrent neural network, we had to do back propagation through time. So we input one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, so on samples. And then you do back propagation, tack, 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 through time, right? And so this stuff takes forever. And also it has the issue that has, you know, a temporal dependency. So you have to always go back and forth the whole sequence, right? It's not really parallelizable, right? Uh, moreover, the hidden, uh, hidden representation is updated sequentially. So the hidden representation over here update was very far from here. And we had problems with long term dependencies. How did we solve that? We had to introduce gating mechanism, which is like selectively remembering or forgetting information. And if it's very long sequence, maybe you don't even get enough gradients coming back or whatever. So in this case, everything is processed in parallel, right? You have the input, you compute some transformation of all the inputs and then poof, you get the output. Here you have the final target, you measure the distance and then poof, you perform back prop. Vertically, there is no temporal information anymore. These items, you can swap them. There is no information. Each item can look at every other item. That's why it's called um, permutation equivariant, right? You can change the order of the items. Nothing changes. But then how do we 
tell that this is a sequence, it's not a set. Well, you have to provide a additional information to each input, which is basically telling, oh, this is the first input. This is the second input. This is the third input. This is the fourth input. So that even if you shuffle the items, the network still knows that this is going to be the first item. This is going to be the second item. This is going to be the third item. This is going to be the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh and whatever, right? The network doesn't know about the order because there is no order in the attention module, right? Therefore, you need to provide the order as additional information to the network. Okay. What is the correct terminology? As you can tell, because we already see what is the, the encoder, and this is the encoder, right? The self-attention is the encoder part. What is the left-hand side? It's the predictor, right? Which is mixing the hidden representation from the source and the hidden representation for the target, delay target, right? What is the last module? You, of course, the last module is going to be decoded. This is the model of the transformer, which has Encoder, encoder, where encoder, right? encoder, and delayed encoder, predictor, decoder, right? Yeah, no, cool. Uh, the, 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 this, is, this is coming from the Z transform, okay? So this is like digital signal processing. You have like Fourier transform to see the, the frequency domain, then you have the Z transform to see like, like an expansion in the complex plane in order to have convergence of uh function like transforms that of function that cannot uh have the Fourier transform okay so this is like digital signal processing I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer who forgot a lot of things so i sp spend a week restudying this stuff but again just for one symbol convention finally uh let me exit this thing uh this card I'm going to be showing you the notebook that are, is used to use this uh, network and I'm just using the encoder, right? So we go in work, GitHub, PDL, uh, Conda, act, active, activate, PDL, Jupyter Notebook. Okay. So this is going to be the, um, Transformer. All right, so the main parts are going to be the following. So we have a, um, yeah, I call it soft argmax, the, the whatever people call softmax, right? Because it's wrong name. So I have multi head attention. How does it work? So this multi head attention is the following. So here I have the number of heads. As I showed you before, we can have multiple queries, multiple questions per given item in the set. And then I have this D model, which is just the size of D. So here we're going to have these three matrices, the WQ, WK, and WV, which are the rotation matrices, which is mapping my uh, X, the dimension for the XQ, the dimension for the, uh, the X for the key, and the dimension for the X for the V, right? Uh, to the D model, right? Internal dimension D. And then I have my final WH, was, that was the one that was uh, mapping down the the output to whatever dimension we want so this is going to be the the initialization with all the weights here we have the scale dot product which is simply computing uh first of all this division by beta which allows us to have things which have the same uh, length in whatever dimension and then here we're going to have the scores which was the matrix multiplication of my K transpose times the Q, right? We remember that we had the matrix K transpose times the vector Q, and we have multiple Qs. Uh, finally, we have these soft argmax, right? To give you the probabilities. And so finally, you have that the H, which is the sequence of like the, the set of columns, right? Was the V matrix multiplied by these a vectors, right? So the V matrix times the A is going to give you the, the first H, then it's going to be V times the second vector in the A is going to have the second H and so on, right? Uh, and so this module here, it's simply implementing that key, uh, the query keys and value uh, mechanism we saw before, okay? So how does the forward module work? So we have the capital Q which is going to be 
the uh, rotation of my XQ. Why do I call this XQ, XV, X, XK, XV? Because, you know, before we call this, I think X, and also those two can be X if uh, we have self attention, or if you're doing cross attention, these two over here are going to be instead my Xi, right? My, when I call my mama the phone. Anyway, so that's why they have three different names, right? Uh, but potentially uh, the two on the right hand side should be the same, right? Anyway, I just put extensive names such that we can have the full, uh, you know, custom, custom mobility. So we have the Q, my Q matrix is going to be the rotation of this uh, X for the query. Then I have the capital K is going to be the rotation of the Xi or myself. And then I have the V is going to be, again, the rotation of these guys over here. Uh, I performed this uh, scalar, scaled, scale dot product, which was that one over square root of beta of this um, matrix vector, right? The checking each keys against one query, and then I have multiple queries. And then I do this linear combination of the vectors in V based on these coefficients I have in this A matrix. And again, I have as many uh, items in A as the elements in the uh, in my set T, right? Because I have T questions. I'm going to have T uh, final mixed values, right? Cool. Uh, here, I'm going to be grouping heads, doesn't matter. And then I'm going to get the final version by, you know, doing the, 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 the change in dimensionality, given that we had multiple heads, okay? Uh, here are some tests that are just checking out this correct size. And as well here. And so what are we doing here? We have to create a convolutional net, right? When we have the transformer, we have seen that it has two items inside. We had the attention module, self or cross or whatever, right? And then on top, we had this convolutional item, which is operating, you know, a transformation for each item. It doesn't have receptive field, right? Receptive field is one. Just check the given item. And so simply like we have two layers of uh, like we have two linear layers or whatever, because again, it acts on the single item, right? And then we have the final, uh, like we have a non-linear function. And so my convolutional layer that is operating on each sample in this case is just using the linear. But again, this linear is going to be the same as a convolution of uh, with a size one, window one. And so you have the X. It's going to be the output of the convolution. We send it through the nonlinearity, and then we have another rotation, right? So rotation, squashing, rotation. And so the final encoder layer is going to be this matching, like the, this, the sandwich between these two items, right? We had a multi-head attention and then the convolution net. And then we had, remember, right? We had the residual connection and the layer normalization. So how does the forward look? Well, that's pretty much uh, self-explanatory, right? So we, uh, for example, for the self-attention here, right? Uh, we are going to be providing a multi-head attention. Like we're going to send my X three times, right? Because X for the query, X for the keys, and X for the values, right? And all of them are going to be X. So we have self-attention. Then the output of this self-attention is going to be the input plus the output, as we have seen from the slide before. And then we send this residual uh, item here through the layer normalization, as you can see. Then there was the second part. We get this output over here through this convolutional network. And then again, we sum to the output of the convolutional network uh, the input, right? So this out one was the output of the first module. So we, we this is going to be the input to the convolutional network, sum to the output of the convolutional network. And then we send this through the layer normalization. And so this is how you can write in, you know, five, 10 lines, basically, a encoder, a transformer encoder, right? Here we create some embeddings for the positions, but we don't really care. And then the final encoder, uh, what was the difference here? So this was the encoder layer. The final encoder may have multiple layers, right? 
So if you have a whatever number of layers, they're going to be appending multiple uh, encoder layers, right? And then we also want to have these embeddings that are giving us the information regarding the position where all these things are, okay? And that's it. Then here we train this to do some uh, movie review, okay? So there is like a classifier in which we have uh, the encoder and then we have a, a linear layer. And then we send, we're going to be using uh, a final cross entropy to train this. Okay. So we have optimizer and so on, right? And that's it. So we send the forward, we're going to compute the, uh, the loss, which is in a cross entropy. We zero the grad. We compute the partial derivative and we step in the opposite direction of the gradient. And that's pretty much it for today. All right. Uh, whoops. We went a little bit out of time. I, I hope it was clear. If you left, because it's definitely late, you have the recording. Uh, let me know if there are any questions. I will update the slides because I realized there, there was no clear um, uh, uniform notation with the previous lessons. Uh, let me know if there are questions and otherwise I see you next week, uh, which we're going to be talking about latent variable energy based model for speech recognition with an invited speaker. Okay. It's going to be very fun. Very cool. I think. All right. Thanks for your attention. Sorry for being over time. I hope it was clear. These are these, uh, transformers and attention are very popular and very effective and have been, uh, giving us breakthrough, uh, results in the recent, uh, you know, times, right? So pay attention, rewatch the lesson, check the ending. If you're, you already left. Thanks with me. Thanks for being with me. Have a nice end of the week. Bye-bye.